Good morning and welcome back to my channel. My name is Rachel, that is the R in the RK Stumbling Bear, and I am a reader and a writer. And today I am back for another new releases book review. This time for The Galaxy and the Ground Within by Becky Chambers. This is the fourth book in her Wayfarer series and the ultimate from what we are, what we understand. I received this as a, an arc through a Goodreads giveaway. I am probably one of the few people who actually like this style of cover that the United States does, or they do in the United States. To me, it just, I feel like it fits the emotional backdrop of the book. Don't get me wrong, the UK covers are also really pretty, but I'm totally okay with these as well. I'm excited that I got to read this at the beginning of September as one of my Space Opera September buddy reads. How I am going to structure this is I'm going to give the synopsis of the book, I'm then going to do my non-spoiler thoughts, and then I am going to do my spoiler-filled thoughts, and then I'll do my outro. So the galaxy and the ground within is, it's centered on a world where it has habitat domes and the characters in this book are meeting at a pit stop basically on their way to access another tunnel to keep going on their journeys. So it's kind of like a truck stop in space. And the characters are, the first are a mom and a child, LaRue, that own the five, what is it, and own the five hop one shop stop. We have Rovig, which is a Quailin. We have Pei, who we actually met in the first book, um, an Aeolin. And we have Speaker, who is an Akarik. And all are here to either refuel, rest in between going on and whatnot. And then a freak technological accident happens. Um, some satellites get damaged and it causes a cascade failure and there's a lot of debris in the sky. And so they have to remain at the pit stop for longer than they were planning. So moving into my non-spoiler thoughts, something I thought that was very interesting about this book is that none of the characters are human. And in each of her other books, there's always been human characters. And in the third book, like The Record of a Spaceborn Few, that centered on the Exodian culture, which was, which was predominantly human. And so then to go to this, where none of them are human, I was surprised. It wasn't what I expected. And from the synopsis, you don't realize that until you start reading. And I actually wish that this story in some ways had happened earlier in the series, just because I felt like at the beginning of the story, a lot of world building needed to be put in place, especially since we were talking about cultures that had not gotten a lot of screen time in the earlier books or a lot of had not got or had not gotten a lot of page time in the earlier books. And at the same time, after reading this book, I am now saddened that there's no more because I would have liked to know more about the universe. And I know she, maybe she's not going to write any more novels, but I could always hope for some more, sh like some short stories, just dropping us in and out because this universe is interesting. Again, I want more. Now I know a lot of readers of Becky Chambers works always say how much of a character driven aspect she has. For me, I always feel like her books are more theme heavy. They have a lot of fun characters but the, it's really the themes that pull them together and make you to, and make me continue thinking about them long after I am, I have stopped reading the book or I, long after I have finished reading the book. I'm not usually a theme reader, but because she works these themes around the characters, I think it enhances that. Rebecca Chambers also likes to have multiple points of view, which normally for me is off-putting. I don't like a lot of multiple view books. I, I'm finding as I get older, I don't want to be following multiple characters. I like following a few and having a story. But in this book, you need those multiple views because you need to have them merge into one another. 
And then just as each of the characters are finding out about one another, that's how the reader then starts to find out and learn more information about what makes these specific characters work. And so for the big themes of this book, for me, I, I'm getting the theme of community and the theme of multicultural. And then this community aspect, it's they've been through a certain environment. It's like going to space camp and then you continue to talk to the people in your group years later. That I mean, that one event might be the only thing you have in common, but you have formed a bond with these people. That is the sort of community that I see has developed here. And really what it made me think of is how many different communities I am in in my own personal life. I mean, I have my primary job. I have my secondary job. I have my religious group. I have my blood family. I have my book club group. I have this community here on YouTube. We live in so many various different communities and they don't always go with one another, but they all are a part of who we are. And it's okay that not all of our communities do fit in with one another. They don't have to. Our community doesn't have to be just one thing. We can be part of many communities. And I feel like that is something else that this book was saying. And again, the other theme of multicultural is we are all, even if we're in the, a shared community, we are all different and we all come from separate other communities as well. And the only way you know how someone is or what they think is by talking to them because we don't 100% believe everything from our other communities. For a personal family example, my grandfather served in the Philippines and did not have a high opinion of the people, the Filipino people. One of my mother's cousins married a woman from the Philippines and they were afraid to tell him because they knew how he felt. But my or my mom's cousin loves his wife and realized that she was not who my grandfather had dealt with. And it was a different time period. It wasn't war. It was peace. Nobody, no one person can represent a huge community. There's too many different voices and nuances in communities. And you can't just sit, single somebody out and be like, oh, you're the lone person in this community. So thus you represent everyone. We need to stop doing that to one another. Sorry, I'm going to get off my soapbox and I'm going to move more into my spoiler, my spoilery thoughts on this book. So for my spoilery thoughts, I really was very much intrigued with Rovig. He, he's the uh, Quaylen and I believe in the, um, I believe in the first book you meet some Quaylen and they're very much against cloning and you don't get a great view of them. And so then getting to meet Quaylen and realize his society has a very much we are people and everybody else's other idea, but yet he wants to experience the, a multicultural environment to the point that it got him exiled from his home made him a very fascinating character for me, especially because the circumstances of what has brought him to where he is now has not downtrodden him. He's accepted that this has happened, but he's still positive and he still has curiosity about life and still wants to live it. And I loved that. So in the second book, you get to see a little bit of Aeolian culture and how when women are become fertile. They can go to a household of men, have sex, get pregnant, give birth to an egg, and leave that with the men to later hatch and be raised in their household. We got to see a different side of that aspect of the culture with Pei, who enters in what they call their fertile period, they call the shimmering, and how she is then having to change her plans. Her original plans was to go visit Ashby 
and she was excited to go see him. It's been a while, but now she's shimmering and she feels like she now needs to go to a collective and fulfill her mandate as a woman, basically, to give an egg to for the next generation. And then this also kind of shows the differences in how Aelin society works, where the women are more, or the women have a choice to be hands-on or hands-off with their children. It's more the men who have gone to school to be a parent. It's a job, not just something you do because of biology. And then you have somebody from a different, one of the other, you have one of the other uh, characters talking to Pei about this and pointing out your species isn't in danger of becoming extinct. If you don't want to do this, that's the only reason you need to not do it. You don't have to justify your actions to anybody else. And that made me think a lot of consent culture, where all it needs to be is, no, I don't want to, and there should be no pressure to then do something that somebody wants done. I've said, no, that's it. I or I don't want to, that's the end. And turning it in a, into the different concept of just because you're a woman doesn't mean you have to have children. And as someone who has a stepson, but not any little ones of my own, I found that very satisfying. I feel like that is a necessary part of the conversation that we need to have. Um, people who are having children, I think they need to want this. This isn't something that should be forced upon you or just said, oh, well, this is what society dictates. No, it, it's okay to like children, but not to want children of your own. That is okay. It does not mean you're weird. It, it's okay. I guess all I can say is it's okay. But it, so it made Pei's story very compelling. Just because we had met her before, I was a little first off put on her because um, she seemed more cagey. I'm not sure if that's the right word I want to use, but it, uh, she means she seemed more distant, distant from the other characters at first. So I also think the balance with Pei not wanting to be a mother, give birth to an egg is also in a very interesting balance between with her wanting to defend her culture, especially her society is fighting another society or her species is fighting another species. And that was another topic of conversation between her and another character was about war. And in fact, my favorite quote, um, it's from page 154. The nice thing about having the, or having the physical copy of this book is I can write in it. I don't do that all the time, um, but I do like to underline things or write notes if something really strikes me. And this was something that did, and this is Pei speaking. When you boiled it down, war was nothing more than an argument in which no one had landed on a better solution than killing each other. And I think that really sums up war in our society even today. See, like I said, themes. <laughs> Becky Chambers goes into themes. So I'm going to go on to the speaker, who was a very interesting character for me. And I think she was put in there to really turn everybody on their heads because they all had the idea where every intelligent species breathes oxygen. And she's like, nope. I breathe methane. That's why I'm in this suit, because I can't breathe your atmosphere and live in your society without it. And I think this is where I really started to love Rovig, because he was very curious about Speaker and like, wait, how does your society work? How can I communicate with you? Especially because uh, Rovig does like video game design to, for like a VR virtual reality, but he doesn't do it so much for like a the gaming aspect, but for the experience, he does what he calls vacation sims, but he's never been able to do one for the Acheric race because he just didn't know enough about it. But now that he's getting this opportunity to speak more with an Acheric, 
he is very much interested. And something I loved was that he prepared little foods, did research, prepared little foods, and sent the foods to Speaker, and then invited Speaker to to put those foods in her spacesuit, and then to come and eat breakfast with him. I thought that was incredibly inventive, a great way to figure out how to work around something that for many others would have been an obstacle. And I love how the book ends, how you see that their the community and the bonds that they have formed go further. One person does something for one who then is able then to do something for someone else who is able to do something for somebody else. And it's a ripple effect. And I can completely see these characters coming back together for Tupo's gender reveal party, which might make a really great, fun, short story if Becky Chambers is listening. But switching to my final thought, I know that this book is going to be one that sits with me for a long time. And from reading this book, it has definitely changed how my future rereads of the other three books are going to go especially since I have more information about the cultures that I'm going to be seeing. That said, I don't think this was a perfect execution of what it was trying to do. It's still very heartwarming, gives you hope, gives you the Becky Chambers vibes, but I feel like this was more of a scattered story at the same time. And so I am giving it four out of five stars. It's possible that on a future reread, because I own the book, that will change. Maybe I'll come to, I'll grow to love it more. That's happened with some of her other books. I gave them one rating and then over time I ended up loving them even more. Definitely will continue to read more of Becky Chambers and I look forward to her different worlds. Like I said, I'd love to get some short stories in this one as well. If you have read this book, please leave me a comment down below. Tell me what you think. Do you think I'm wrong? Do you think I'm right? Did you see something different in the book than I did? Please share that. 